Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. You can ask gardening questions down in the comment section below the video and I pick from those each week. I am in Boise, Idaho in a city park, um, which is quite beautiful. Uh, everything in the city is uh, amazingly beautiful. There's uh, lots of mountains uh, for the background the other direction, but the sun was being weird. So I have this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful lake uh, back here behind me. Uh, this past week, I did an all-star question and answer video where uh, seven uh, folks that I uh, know or have communicated with uh, answered gardening questions, and I have another one of those planned coming up uh, with some other folks uh, as well that I didn't include in that one. I had been holding it for a little while, and I, I just went ahead and put it up, but I do have some other folks that are sending me some uh, answer, uh, answering some questions as well, so I'm excited about that. Put up an additional video with Linda Vodder earlier in the week as well, and you might see another before and after video before before this one um, with your incredible photos of your landscapes that you guys have been working on. Uh, uh, I really appreciate all the participation in those videos. If you're interested in sending in before and after videos of your gar or photos uh, from your garden, this is the uh, email address right here, horttube at gmail.com. And with all that, uh, let's jump in and uh, answer some gardening questions uh, from uh, last week's uh, q and I always get these questions about my thoughts on the Master Gardener program, and I answered this a few months back. I mean, it's a great, it's a great program. I've had um, Master Gardener group from Johnston County toured our garden earlier this year, and I think from, gosh, um, one of the biggest, I think, benefits of the Master Gardener program is all those people are interconnected now. So it's a lot of like-minded people um, who are interested in gardening that get to go and do these events together, have meetings together. Um, and I think as much as anything, uh, that's probably something you would get out of it, um, is finding a community of people that are like you. Uh, you know, so obviously you're going to get a benefit out of learning uh, gardening through whatever program um, you know, you're taking the test through. But uh, uh, I think at the end of it, uh, the friend group um, is probably going to be as important as anything else uh, with the Master Gardener program. Let's see. So somebody asked about business growth opportunities in horticulture uh, in the Southeast. And I think this would probably be the same anyway. Like in every business, we've seen massive, you see, we, we see massive consolidation. So the nurseries have really gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, what we're left with is a lot of really giant nurseries and then some medium-sized nurseries who are all knocking on the doors of the same, gar the same five garden centers in their towns. And then specialty nurseries, maybe native plant nurseries or um, super, super interesting things that other people just aren't growing or maybe specialized things like grafted things like Japanese maples or grafted conifers, which there's a question about uh, coming up. Uh, so there's a lot of either specialization or really giant, really giant nurseries that serve Home Depots and Lowe's and Walmarts and you know the big box stores um, out there. So the opportunities there are either in support of those large nurseries because they have lots of things that they can't do, um, you know, or are too, a little too slow for them. They like to turn space really, really quickly in those big nurseries. And so, um, as an example. Uh, camellias can take an, an extra six months to a year, uh, maybe two years to grow in a three gallon container versus some sort of holly. And they really don't, they, they would rather have somebody grow those camellias uh, in a gallon pot into some sort of sizable plant and then send it in and then they finish it quickly and send it out because they probably maybe already have a market for it to be sold. So there's in support of large nurseries, um, is one opportunity for sure. And then, of course, then any kind of specialization. Uh, again, you know, specialized perennials, new varieties. Um, and then there, I think there's retail opportunity as well for those specialized things. If you wanted to open up some sort of retail shop that was, you know, I, I don't know if the house plant thing is oversaturated now. <laughs> it's, it's every town I go to, every city I go to, there's several house plant stores that have opened up. Everybody's really excited about house plants. I don't know where that becomes oversaturated. I mean, the houseplant thing does this. My entire time in this business, it does this. And we're in a peak right now, and I just wonder where that, you know, well, well, when, when people buy and kill enough houseplants, <laughs> it kind of erodes that business again, and then it comes back and forth. Uh, so I don't know about the houseplant uh, business right this minute, but um, 
again, some, something that's specialized, unique, or different than other people. And then, again, I think there's a lot of opportunity in starting plants for other nurseries. Okay, um, so somebody asked, uh, is compost under pine needles okay? So I guess they're putting, out, putting down a layer of compost and then they're going to use pine straw uh, as the top mulch. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly the way the forest floor would be in a you know woodland area in North Carolina or Alabama or Georgia where we have pine trees. You would have the broken down material under it, the composted material, and then on top of that you would have pine straw or leaves or whatever things are dropping on the forest floor. So yeah, that's perfect. Um, somebody said how to enhance their Coosa dogwood growth because deer keep eating it. I think you're going to have to put some sort of fencing around it uh, and allow it some period of time to grow without being damaged. Um, I don't know that there's a way to make it grow faster. I mean, you could s fertilize it, I guess, but you know, you probably end up putting it under some sort of stress trying to push it by making it grow faster. I think you're best to protect it. Um, so put some sort of net deer netting around it uh, and just kind of commit to that for at least a growing season, maybe two. Get some real growth on it. And then once it's tall enough, they'll eat it, but they'll only eat it up to where they can reach it. Um, you'll kind of see that in woodland areas where you can see through the lower canopy where the deer can eat everything that's like six foot or lower. But after that, um, you know, they can't really reach it. So I had done a consultation for somebody in Bel Air, Maryland. Consultations are available over on my website, horttube.com, listed down below the, uh, the video here. Um, and they wanted some additional support for gardening in Bel Air, Maryland. You know, I would go to local garden centers and ask if there's anybody who does co local consultation work uh, that they know of, because, you know, um, or the Master Gardener program that's in your area may know of somebody who does on-site consultation. Uh, to you know, to to continue to help you uh, in your area, but that be true for anybody, whether it's Bel Air, Maryland, or any place. You can eat the best Master Gardener program, and the really established garden centers. Those are important things uh, in these communities. Uh, is the garden centers that have been there for 25, 30, 40 years. They're the folks that are going to know the most about the soil types you have about planting, you know, they're guaranteeing plants for a year, so they've probably put a little effort in learning how to teach people how to plant and take care of things, uh, you know, when they're putting a guarantee on them, uh, I would think. So, so somebody has a really bad spot of Ro Rosa Sharon coming up, it's suckering everywhere, and uh, it's just overall problematic, but it's surrounded by gravel and plastic liner was put down. They wanna know how to go about killing it. I think you just gotta get in there and dig it all out. The gravel, the plastic liner, the Rosa Sharon um, suckers, all of it. Um, and then, cause they wanna plant native perennials back in its place. I think if you don't get in there and really dig all those root, all that root material out and all that plastic out, you're gonna to continue to fight those things in your new native perennial border um, in the future. So unfortunately that one's, uh, the answer to that was just hard work. Um, Somebody is in uh, Tennessee, zone 7B, and they've got neutral soil, meaning their soil pH is right around seven. Uh, the pH is between one and 14, seven is neutral. Anything below seven, we consider acidic soils. Anything above seven, uh, we consider alkaline soils. Theirs is near neutral, and they want to grow lots of acid-loving plants. And there's lots of acid-loving plants or things like azaleas, uh, rhododendrons, hollies, uh, lots of plants that need access to iron. And um, uh, iron is most available with a lower pH. I have a video on the channel called Why is Soil pH so important? Uh, if you wanna go back and take a look at that, it will explain a little more about what I'm talking about right now. But you can use sulfur uh, to temporarily lower your pH some. Uh, but keep in mind, any pH adjustments you're trying to do are really very temporary. If you're trying to lime to raise your pH or you're trying to add sulfur to lower your pH, those things are going to be pretty temporary. You may want to go more with uh, you know, the plants that will take uh, more neutral soils, although around seven, I think there's probably enough iron available. I would plant the things you want to plant uh, if your pH is right around 6.8 to 7.2. Plant the things you want to plant, and only if you're having problems um, would I then try to adjust the pH or switch to a different, different set of plants. Um, but I think around neutral, most things are going to be okay um, and have the, uh, have the nutrients available to them. 
that they need. So somebody asked, I had shown a bunch of grafted uh, conifers uh, at a nursery a few months back and there was a Mr. Bowling Ball uh, Arborvita on a, basically on a stick. So it was grafted to another, another plant and they wanted to know um, what plants these things are being grafted onto. It's just a more upright Arborvita that it was being grafted onto. So you'll see all the dwarf firs. We're gonna see uh, in a week or so, I'm gonna have a lot of videos from a beautiful conifer nursery in Oregon. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'll show you some of that at that time. So you, you know, you'll see dwarf, little dwarf firs that are uh, grafted onto a very a straight, very straight pole. It's just another type of fir that's a more upright, vigorous, upright grower. And then they'll take the dwarf one or the weeping fir and graft it onto, uh, onto that one. So, um, but I'll, sh I'll show off some of that in the next week or so. Somebody wanted to know where, where their baled pine shavings could be used in place of wood chips. While they both are wood, uh, the, the pine shavings, the baled pine shavings in all likelihood have been dry, kiln dried. And so they're gonna be a little slower to break down. Um, they're kind of, by drying them out, they're gonna last, they're gonna last longer. Uh, and if your purpose is to put down something that will break down quickly, improve your soil quickly, the pine shavings are probably going to be slower. Also a little more expensive, obviously, buying them in bales. They will work. Uh, it's just going to take a minute longer for them to, uh, to get going on the breakdown process, I would think, uh, from, from, from them being dried. Uh, somebody asked about, and probably lots of questions I've gotten about trees losing their leaves early this year. Uh, definitely in the south and across the Midwest, trees are losing leaves at different times than they normally do. Uh, and it's completely normal under stressful conditions. So if you have, uh, you know, you've had dry conditions, hot conditions, those kinds of things, it's going to change the way in which that plant goes to sleep. And so I don't really worry about it all that much, but it's definitely a difference out there in how plants are going to sleep. It's been fantastic coming up here to Idaho and seeing all the incredible fall color because we just don't get much of it in Raleigh. We always have uh, just enough stress uh, that the Japanese maples don't get the great fall color that they get in other places or the uh, red buds typically are tired and here they've got, you know, have some fall color and so on and so forth. We typically just have the plants kind of go crashing into sleep. Uh, so it's not abnormal for me to see, but uh, for others, it probably is a slightly abnormal to see them go to sleep a little bit earlier or differently. You know, like one tree lose its leaves and one tree not lose its leaves. It could have been drought related, heat related, too much water related, probably unlikely that one this year, but um, whatever. Something was different. Uh, they'll be fine uh, once they get to sleep. Uh, let's see. Uh, so somebody's talking about planting in fall in Texas, and I think this is a great question because Texas is one of those places where you would say fall is for planting, for sure. But they've had, you know, three out of the last four years, pretty extreme freezes and pretty rapid, um, pretty rapid temperature drops. Uh, and so this folk, you know, this person had lost a Laura Petalum last year. If you're I leave that stuff up to you. You know, you can plant things as long as they're hardy in your area in the fall, but um, for your normal temperatures. But if you've had, if you're in an area that's really experienced some wild winters in the last few years, you might move around and plant them in the spring. And that way, you know, unfortunately planting in the spring, they're not as established and you're going to have to water them more during the summer, which can be also a difficult thing, I would imagine in Texas as well. But I, you know, I'll leave that for your, you know, the amount of uh, risk that you're willing to take. It is better probably in Texas to plant in the fall. Um, I literally have ducks walking up to me right now, which is kind of funny. Like four feet away from me, uh, there are ducks. I don't, you're not gonna be able to see it on the camera. It's kind of wild. <laughs> They're just walking around me. Okay. Uh, but you can also also if you are going to if you are going to fall plant something and you're worried about it surviving that first winter, be prepared to cover that thing. So make sure you have sheet or blanket or something like that prepared if you are going to fall plant it and you're nervous about it. Okay, narrow topped containers. <laughs> you know, this is, think about uh, when we're container planting things, these beautiful containers that start out, they get wider and then they get narrower at, right at the top of the container. Um, you know, 
people are talking about how to remove, you know, somebody asked about how to remove the plants without breaking the pots. It's very difficult. I usually will take a trowel and I'll just cut the roots straight down from the collar of the pot and just basically create a smaller root system and then pull it out like that. I highly recommend if you're doing shrub or woody plant plantings to use containers that broaden at the top and not narrow at the top, okay? You can use those pots that narrow some at the top for your annual plantings or you know things that you're changing out pretty frequently. But if you put a woody plant, uh, especially something that's very valuable to you in one of those containers, uh, they're very, very difficult to get out. So buy containers that kind of get wider at the top uh, for your woody shrubs and, and it will be much easier uh, to get things out of them in the future when you need to transplant them or up pot them or refresh the soil or whatever the heck you're doing. Somebody's burning some large trees and they want to know about spreading the ashes around the garden. Absolutely. I burned post Hurricane Fran. There was literally just nowhere to even take uh, all the material that was, that was produced uh, in the amount of trees that were taken down. So I burned gosh, a hundred trees uh, at, my, uh, at my house during that period of time. Just big giant fires every night. I would landscape for people during the day, repairing theirs, their landscapes, and then I'd come home to mine and uh, cut things up and burn things. But I used all that material out in the garden and new garden spaces, and it worked absolutely, it worked great. Again, anything you're adding to your garden like that, spread it out far and wide, okay? Don't concentrate it in one spot. Somebody asked about cutting back. Um, pink mully grass. Uh, mull any of the grasses like that you'll want to cut back late winter right before the new growth is starting or as the new growth is starting because you don't want to cut any of the new growth for next year off. But you want them to go as long as possible. That top part of that grass is actually protecting uh, the, uh, the, uh, everything down below it. So don't, I wouldn't cut it back. They, you're much more likely to have them rot cutting them back in the fall, although I see some people do it. Some people go out as soon as their grasses look tired and they, they knock them back and they don't have any problems. Uh, but um, I, I had problems, I've had problems doing it uh, personally and uh, you know cutting them back in the uh, early winter. So I wait till the late winter, that's the time to do it. Next up is a really, really great question and uh, one I've avoided talking about somewhat because the native the native plant thing has just become a uh, uh, such a hot button topic people are either all in we have nothing but natives we can't have named cultivars we can't have anything but natives and this is the way it's going to be or people that don't even know this is an issue or people that I mean it's just uh, it's so all over the place that I kind of avoid uh, talking about it a little bit because people just get so emotional about native uh, native plants but this person had a great question Things called native. Um, what does it actually mean? Uh, because uh, you know, when I hear the word native, I think most people are are calling are are talking about North American native. So I could have a um, uh, an Oregon grape poly, which uh, you know are native here to this you know Idaho and and uh, Oregon uh, area, and call that. Can I call that native in North Carolina? Uh, it's not actually native to North Carolina, but that's kind of where we are. Uh, if I say clethora is a native shrub um, to the southeast United States, and when I, I tend to say that on my videos, I'll say it's a native to the southeast. I'll sometimes I'll tell you where I've seen it out in the wild. Uh, clethora tends to grow in wet areas along creeks and streams, uh, you know, and I've seen it a few times, uh, only a few times actually, uh, in the wild, and I do a heck of a lot of hiking in the southeast. But that plant uh, being sold in you know, other states where it's not native, but being called native is again, North American native. That's, that's actually what people are saying. And I think because of the emotional uh, component to this native plant thing, all plants gotta be native, all plants have to be native. I think that it's gonna be used against folks. Um, and by saying something is native when it's just a North American, you know, a North American native, it's native to the West Coast, but it's being sold on the East Coast, but it's being called native. People just want that word. They want that word, whether that word's on a pot or on a container or somebody saying it, they just want native. Native sounds great. Native must do better. Native must be whatever. And so uh, <laughs> native is... Uh, 
you know, we have named cultivars of natives, or people who've deemed that native ours, um, which they're really, you know, kind of not natives. They were improved natives. And then we have native plants being sold out of region, uh, and we have native plants. So it's, it's going to be an interesting time uh, in the next 10 years. I see the native plant nursery in, in, in North Carolina, I can look at their list right now. It's full of native R's or it's full of crosses between Asian, not full of, but you know, a cross between an Asian and a, and a, and a U.S. native uh, Agastache. Uh, is that a native? Um, you know, that kind of thing. And that's a native plant nursery. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's all over the place. And again, I think it's going to unfortunately be weaponized. Um, you know, because everything's going to native, 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 um, and people are just going to put native on anything that, that's even remotely <laughs> can call to put the word native on uh, in the next ten or twenty years, because there's such a movement toward uh, using more native plants. And so, really, you need to get a book for your area, somebody that's specialized in your area that wrote a book about the native plants of Idaho where I'm at right now are the native plants of Washington State. If you really want native plants, uh, that's gonna be the way to go, is to find a book related or a website that's very specific to the native plants of your state or your even, even more specifically, your area of a state. Um, we have you know, something like 4,000 native species of plants in North Carolina. 500 of them probably only grow in the coast and 500 of them probably only grow in the mountains. So are those natives to Raleigh? to the middle of the state? So those are questions. That, that's in this question is a very loaded question, which is what is truly a native plant? So again, if you're, if you're interested and you want native plants for your area, make sure you buy a book or find a website that's very specific to your area. Otherwise, you're gonna fall victim to things just saying native everywhere you go in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I, I think that's where we're heading. Um, so anyway, uh, somebody talking about, um, uh, brown, they have a brown turkey fig in zone 7B in New Jersey. Um, are they pushing their luck by not covering it uh, during the winter time? So, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's hardy in zone 7B, so your average low temperature is unlikely to kill it during the winter. But your persistence of cold that you're going to get more in New Jersey than I'm going to get in North Carolina um, has the chance to do a little more damage to it. So I would just cover it when it's going to be abnormally cold or cold for a long time. Um, you don't have to cover it constantly. Uh, but if you are going to have unusually cold temperatures or just cold temperatures that seem to be lasting two or three days where maybe it doesn't come above freezing you know, for two or three days, that's the times I would cover it. Uh, and you should be fine. Somebody wanted to know if Diamond Spire Gardenia is nematode resistant. No, um, they're in central Florida. Florida has an issue with a uh, uh, nematode issue. So you'll see a lot of things grafted uh, in Florida that you wouldn't see in other places. So there's nematode resistant rootstocks and then the plants are grafted on top of it. Even tomatoes, uh, as an example of that, we have uh, grafted tomatoes uh, that folks can grow in uh, Florida that keep the nematode problem um, at bay. So you, you would, uh, if you have a nematode issue on gardenias, you would get a grafted, uh, a grafted variety. Uh, but that is an issue, um, a pretty big issue in Florida. Uh, let's see. So somebody wants to overwinter a hydrangea in a pot in zone six um, in a heated flower shed. Uh, it's a um, tuxedo hydrangea. Well, um, I don't think you need to have it in a heated um, potting shed. Uh, you, can, you can keep it a few degrees warmer in that shed on nights that are really, really bad, but any day that you can put it outside where it's not below freezing, I would. So don't keep it heated all winter. It does need some cold. Uh, it does need to get some cold on it during the winter time. So you know, don't go to the extreme in the other direction of protecting it to the point of it not getting the chill hours it needs to actually go to sleep and stay dormant long enough to, uh, to put on a big show next year. So be careful with that. You can, I would put it, in the, put it in the flower shed on nights that, it's going, that that pot would freeze solid. Other than that, um, have it outside as much as possible. Somebody has sawdust available locally. Can this be used? Um, can this be a mulch barrier? Yeah, you can use sawdust as mulch um, for sure. Uh, again, just like anything else, don't go crazy and put too thick of a layer around your established plants. Just you know, a couple, two or three inches 
will make a great uh, mulch barrier. Um, sometimes these wood mulches like that around existing plants can use a little bit of nitrogen to break down and sometimes off color a few things. This is one of those things that's kind of over, over talked about, but it probably does need to be a little bit talked about. If you have perennials and annuals, uh, herbaceous things that you're using these wood products around, it has the potential to steal a little bit of nitrogen, have them be slightly off colored, uh, that kind of thing. Your shrub should be fine regardless, but in your perennial beds and annual beds you may not want to use that material you may want to use compost or something like that instead uh, so somebody asked about managing pruning debris you know what to do with it all the things that are limbs and things i have a chipper at the house and i did a video last year chipping up some uh, material it's a silly little video literally i just pulled out an electric chipper and ran my <laughs> ran limbs through it on a video but that uh uh, that's what I do is just chip it down to small pieces that are usable and then use them in your existing beds uh, as mulch. Um, it makes great material unless you're dealing with diseased things. If you're taking out a diseased thing, you might not want to uh, use that as mulch. But um, any of your leaves can be ground up on the driveway with the lawnmower uh, if you want to use them that way. And any of your limbs can just go through a chipper and uh, be made into smaller pieces and used as mulch. Uh, just spread it out again, spread it out far and wide, you know, not, don't concentrate things in one spot. Uh, let's see. Uh, so somebody transplanted a Carolina Sapphire Arizona Cypress and it's struggling. Uh, they want to know whether they should get rid of it or wait until next spring. I don't know how bad it's struggling. So if it's like lost 50% of its, you know, if it's 50% thinner than it was when you, when you moved it, um, for me, conifers tend to come back slower. That's why I'm kind of slow to answer this question. Conifers come back slower than other plants. And so if you have a very damaged conifer, it can take several years sometimes for them to get back to where they were, as opposed to like leafy plants that can kind of quickly, generally, generally very quickly recover, fill in, be blooming again uh, soon enough. Conifers are a little slower. With that said, the Carolina Sapphire um, Arizona cypress is a very fast growing tree. So if it's, if it's not in terrible, terrible shape, I might give that thing a season to see what it does. Because if it's got roots on it, you know, this winter, if it's rooting out, getting itself established a little bit, it may surprise you next year. So in general, conifers I would trash when they're trashy looking because they're slow to come out, but you're, you have a fast growing conifer. So I might give it a chance. Okay. Uh, Okay, so somebody has, somebody in Dublin, Ireland, I think there was another, I think there were a couple that were um, 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 in Ireland this time. They have a poplar uh, tree, and it's a, a lot of root competition in the area that they're gardening in, and they want to know how to garden with root competition. Uh, oh, the, the tree's in a neighbor's yard, and the roots are on their side uh, of the fence. I've talked about getting smaller container material to plant you know, so that it's easier to just in general plant, but you can mound up things a little bit. I've used bark materials to raise the soil around roots uh, and uh, planted directly into that. The main thing when you're gardening with tree roots is if in a normal bed situation where you've prepped a bed, you've gotten rid of the grass, you may have put down some sort of compost material and you're planting the plants, for the vast majority of us, we'll plant that plant and kind of keep an eye on it for three or four months. And if it's an extreme summer, we might continue to baby it some, but for the most part, we can get things established uh, rather quickly. When you're dealing with the space with a lot of root competition, it takes a lot longer for those things to get established. The tree has been there for a long time. It's anchored in the things you're adding to the space. Uh, you know, are basically going to be victimized by a very established tree. So you, you just, it takes longer to get things established and you need to be using things that are dry shade, um, you know, things that are for dry shade. So you're going to have very two different, you know, back to these native plants. There are native plants that grow in dry shaded conditions like carexes and things that I'll see in the woodland areas while I'm hiking. And then I'll come down a hill to a wet area and see a whole new group of plants that are for wet uh, spaces. And so you need to be thinking about using plants that are for dry shade 
when you have root competition. And I have another video coming soon uh, for dry shade plants. And I had a video with Mark Wethington at the Ralston Arboretum a few months back that was on dry shade, uh, dry shade plants. And so may not be the things that are available to you right there in Ireland, but um, that's the things to be asking for or things that will establish themselves in dry shade conditions. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, a couple more uh, before we finish up here. Uh, somebody asked about wood chips versus pine bark. So we're talking about, when I'm talking about planting uh, plants in the southeast, we have pine bark soil conditioner available to us that we can mix in uh, to, the, to that clay soil and it'll create a little bit of drainage. Um, and, uh, uh, but then I talk about not mixing wood into the ground if you can help it. Uh, and somebody just wanted to know the difference. What, what, what would be the difference? The, um, the pine bark, you think about it as the exterior of the tree. It's the protective part of the tree. And it's, uh, it doesn't break down very easily. It's like a cork material uh, around that pine tree or oak or anything. anything any, we're, we're talking about the bark of the tree. It's like a cork material that's protecting that tree. And... Uh, it takes a lot longer to break down. And the reason that shrubs are grown in pine bark uh, materials or bark materials is because it doesn't shrink as well because it doesn't break down. So if you plant, a, 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 you say you put a rose into a three gallon plastic container in pine bark, that pine bark will probably only shrink just a little bit over the six or eight or nine months that it's in that container. It just doesn't break down very quickly. Uh, and it has air in it because it's kind of a, a, a porous material so it holds a little bit of moisture, but not too much moisture. It's just a great material for being incorporated in, into the depth of that container. If I put wood chips in that same container, they're wet. Uh, they, have, they contain a lot of moisture. It was part of that question, you know, about, um, um, about using uh, the, uh, dried, uh, you know, the dried pine shavings earlier. The regular um, wood chips that you get are going to be extremely wet and they're going to shrink <laughs> in that container. So that's one reason that they're not used in the container. Plus, again, they require some nitrogen to break down, which could off color, the wood chips do, uh, could off color your plant slightly. And then they also require, wood requires air um, and to, to have beneficial bacteria and beneficial fungi actually break them down. So if you put them eight or 10 inches down in the hole, it's going to deny them that air. That's where it becomes funky and anaerobic. They, they just, they, instead of being broken down properly and being, the nutrients being returned to your plants, they become anaerobic and funky and smell bad uh, under the ground. The bark just doesn't do that uh, when it's buried down in the, uh, in the ground. It just doesn't break down the same way. And it breaks down over a really long period of time where wood chips can break down really quickly once the engine starts to work. Um, so that, that's kind of the difference between the two and a few issues with burying wood uh, down in the ground that you'll see. Uh, last question for this week. And again, thanks for participating. You can ask gardening questions uh, down below this video and I'll be back next Sunday with another Q&A. Somebody tore out some roses that had rose rosette. Uh, they had heard something about spraying it down with hydrogen peroxide so that they can plant in the area. Uh, I think this is a straightforward decision for me. If you, if you had rose rosette uh, on your knockout roses or your drift roses or whatever, I'm not coming back with roses uh, in that space. Uh, but if you plant anything else, you don't have to worry about sterilizing it. This is rose rosette is a very particular, you know, very, a disease spread by an aerified mite. So it's a teeny tiny little mite. When the wind blows, it picks itself up, floats through the air, lands on another rose kind of by accident spreading this disease. It, you know, it doesn't know it's spreading the disease, but it sticks its little, you know, plunges its little mouth in mouth part into the plant and spreads this rose rosette disease uh, as it goes. Uh, I think if you have rosette in your area right now uh, heavily and you just had it on plants that you had in your own garden, I wouldn't come back with roses uh, into that space, maybe for a few years. But in the meantime, you can plant other things and you don't have to worry about it spreading. So there's really no reason to, to do this hydrogen peroxide thing uh, because I just wouldn't plant roses uh, back into that space. So there you go. Uh, thank you guys very much for asking questions and uh, participating in these videos. And I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.